Welcome to one of the conversation on Italian international culture of the Ragusa Foundation for the Humanities. I'm Andrea Ciccarelli, the president of the Ragusa Foundation. And today we have the pleasure to engage Antonio Monda on a conversation entitled From Hollywood to Cinecittà and Back, Swinging Moods in, in American and Italian Cinema. Antonio Monda is professor of film and television in the Tisch School of the Arts of New York University, a journalist and special correspondent for many newspapers and television programs, in particular right now for La Repubblica, Rai, and La Sette TV. He's a television and cinema director, fiction and non-fiction writer, essayist, and tireless promoter of the literary and cinematic arts. He is the director of Dicembre, a 1990 feature film that was presented at the Venice Film Festival and won the Carro d'Oro and the Cinema Giovane Awards. And I have to say is a, almost entirely, certainly a partially semi-autobiographical film and still one of the best movies that I've seen. And, and we all uh, mourn the fact that Antonio stopped making movies, at least in terms of fictional movies as well as the author of two documentaries, docu-films uh, uh, on Jewish culture and on Italian-American culture in America. These late 1980s, 1980s television films analyze in depth fundamental aspects of American culture, cutting through ethnic, religious, political, sociological, and artistic substrata of the United States culture in the 20th century, and touching upon issues of race, social justice, and cultural identity way before these matters became mainstream academic issues. As a writer, we can at least mention his debut novel, La Soluzione, 2008, and L'America non esiste, non esiste, America doesn't exist, 2012. This last one, the first of a series of novels devoted to the city of New York, or the, at least, that take place in the city of New York. Finally, we need to mention at least one, at least some of his many activities as an organizer of international, international cultural events, beginning with his role as artistic director of the Rome Film Festival, where he has brought protagonists of world cinema such as Robert De Niro, Viola Davis, Mary Streep, Quentin Tarantino, and many others. Definitely worthy of mention is also Le Conversazioni, a literary festival that brings to Italy, to Capri, some of the most important world writers, as well as his latest creature, the event Writers on Writers, which, as the title explains, sees artists, filmmakers, and writers in particular, reading one of their favorite authors. Uh, Caro Antonio, it is a little bit strange, first of all, to speak in English to you, because of course we usually <laughs> speak in Italian, and second, to even uh, asking you, uh, if, you know, to interview you because you are an interviewer, a master interviewer of famous authors and filmmakers, and I will try my best. The first question I have uh, is, uh, if you could give us an assessment in your view, uh, what is your assessment of the historical relationship? between Italian and American filmmakers and producers, both because producers, of course, are also responsible for the movies, and they're also responsible for cultural connections. Prego. Let me first say thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And uh, I'm very honored and pleased to be here as well. And thank you also for the nice words, in particular for my film, Dicembre. Let's start about serious movies, serious filmmakers. Um, everybody knows what is called the Hollywood Renaissance, the great numbers, the great group of filmmakers that in the 70s took over Hollywood. When I say took over Hollywood, I mean that until then there was the so-called studio system. By studio system, I mean that every film was, <clears throat> sorry, created uh, by the mind of a mogul, a producer, Irwin Thalberg, Louis Bill Mayer, Sam Warner, and many, many others, who controlled everything from the very beginning, from the story until the post-production, actually until the release of the film. Hiring producers, executive producers, hiring directors, hiring screenwriters, actors, et cetera, et cetera. This system fell apart in the late 60s for several reasons. A, 
all these great moguls, I forgot a few names, Ari Kohn from Columbia Picture, for example, uh, and Daryl Zanuck, were getting old. They didn't understand the new taste and the new uh, joy of cinema of the audience. And at the same time, the world was changing in the late 60s. I don't have to explain you why and how. In other words, all the films of the late 60s in Hollywood failed, or most of the, well, late, the typical studio system films failed. And a group of new filmmakers took over. They uh, changed the language. They changed the approach. They changed the marketing. They changed everything. At least two, if not three, of these filmmakers were Italian, Italian-American. I'm talking, of course, of Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, and I would add also Michael Cimino and Brian De Palma, although Cimino is not exactly part of this group. Uh, with them, they brought Italian actors, in particular Francis Ford Coppola, Robert De Niro, and, uh, sorry, Robert De Niro, and Brian De Palma De Niro as well, uh, Martin Scorsese De Niro, and, uh, and Coppola also Al Pacino, of course. So in a sense, it was a, a quite occasional that it happened that all these filmmakers or some of these most important filmmakers were Italian. But at the same time, the fact that they changed the language, it has to do something with the Italian approach. But before going there, I wanna say that they were not the first Italian American filmmakers to conquer Hollywood. But before that, uh, there was at least one giant, Frank Capra, but who was a completely different uh, kind of filmmaker for two reasons. First of all, he was Italian. He was born in Bisaquino in Sicily. He moved with his parents when he was seven from Bisaquino to uh, Hollywood. Second, he was tot totally, entirely inside the studio system. He was a producer, he was a filmmaker, uh, a director, sometimes a screenwriter or a co-screenwriter. He was the first major filmmaker to have the name above the title, Frank Capra. Frank Capra has It's a Wonderful Life, which is the ultimate status. You know, when you become a, a name director, a brand director, you put your name above the title. This is how important was filmmaker. It was Frank Capra and he won several awards. But it's completely different, his approach, his language, his work from the filmmakers of the 70s. Uh, again, all, not only because he was Italian, completely Italian, although uh, he was totally in love with the American culture. So this is what happened. And uh, why this happened is because of the change of the time, because of the fact that Harry Kahn, Daryl Zanuck, all the others were becoming too old to understand the new audience. But also these filmmakers, Scorsese, I repeat, uh, Coppola, De Palma, and marginally also Cimino, knew very well European cinema, much more than the, their predecessors did. And in fact, their style was completely or more uh, uh, was closer to the author's style. It was a personal style. Although sometimes it's hidden, like in, in uh, Coppola's Godfather, apparently it's a very classic made film, you immediately recognize what Coppola wants. And if you want, I can go in details. Uh, this is more subtle than what happens with Scorsese. A Scorsese film, you can immediately recognize it from his style, the use of the musical, the fast montage, uh, the energy, the violence. Uh, I'm not saying that one is above the others, but apparently the Coppola films have less, apparently, less style. If you go closer and look closer, you see immediately what he wants from his actors, what he wants from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you for this very specific, precise answer, actually. Um, and uh, what uh, you mentioned, Italian, American, and, uh, and uh, filmmakers, of course, Italian filmmakers, Italian, American filmmakers. And this was a question, actually, I wanted to ask you later. But as you brought it up, in a sense, I'm, I'm going to anticipate this. Um, could you talk about the Italian American filmmakers and their conflicted dual identity roles regarding both American, Hollywood or not, it doesn't matter, American and Italian cinema? That is, how do you see them in this duality between feeling Italian 
an American and neither one or the other, but Italian American, which is of course a specific identity. There are two elements that are important now to analyze. The first one, what Scorsese, Coppola and the others expressed in their movies. Most of them and most of their films deals with criminals, let's face it, if not with mafiosi. Think of The Godfather, for example. And this is, of course, extremely controversial. This has nothing to do with the quality of the film because Godfather, it's a flat out masterpiece. And so is Goodfellas, and so are many, many of their films. But why they narrated and they spoke and they uh, dealt with criminality. This is the very interesting point that we should analyze. And second, how the Italian Americans deal with this fact, deal with it. As you certainly know, some of the organization <clears throat> contrast and hate actually films like, such as Goodfellas of uh, Italian American organization and The Godfather because they say that they portray Italian Americans in a bad way in an evil, mean-spirited, uh, romanticized, maybe, uh, criminal way. And it, uh, it's important to mention that there is a film made by a Jewish filmmaker and written by a Jewish screenwriter. The title is Marty with Ernest Bornein, which is a beautiful love story, which won the Oscars in the late 50s, starring Ernest Bornein, which is the first film where an Italian-American is portrayed not as a criminal, but as a regular guy, he's a man who is a butcher who falls in love with a woman and he feels ashamed because his job is not exactly the most romantic job. He feels uh, not attractive, but it's a beautiful portrait of uh, an average Joe, as they say here. So let's go in back. Uh, Italian Americans feel this conflict. Are we Italian or Americans and why Italian Americans at the movies are often portrayed as criminals. First of all, let's say that Scorsese in particular wouldn't exist as a filmmaker if he wouldn't know so well Italian cinema and in particular the work of Roberto Rossellini. Uh, is there anything in common between Paisan and let's say Taxi Driver? Very little. However, there is one element that, that Scorsese underlines every time the search of the truth. According to Rossellini, it was important to film in real location, mix non-professional actors to uh, professional actors, think of Open City, Aldo, uh, Anna Magnani and Aldo Fabrizi with several non-professional actors. In Paisan, most of them are non-professional. Scorsese does a different uh, <clears throat> job. For example, in Goodfellas, he casts uh, great and professional actors, Robert De Niro, Ray Liotta, uh, Joe Pesci, who else is there, Paul Sorvino, Lorraine Bracco. With them, he hires extras and people with very, very dubious, <laughs> uh, uh, I'd say, behavior. Uh, some of them are criminals. This is the way he looks for the truth. Uh, but at the same time, he tries not to hide who these people are. And the element of who we are is answered through his films, as he does Coppola. The Godfather, as I said before, is one of the greatest films ever made, and is possibly also a romanticized version of, uh, of Mafia, which makes it also a dangerous masterpiece. Dangerous, because we too tend to root for them to be with them, to be with the Corleone. But at the same time, he tries to capture who they are besides the fact they're criminals. In other words, what makes The Godfather a masterpiece is not only the great film, the great um, direction, the great acting, the great cinematography, but the fact that uh, under Coppola try to see human beings, men and women, before he sees criminals. Let me give you an example. When he shoots Conny, Costanza Corleone, played by his sister, Talia Shire, uh, I'm sure you know that Talia Shire is Francis Coppola's sister, and he shows Marlon Brando playing the Vito Corleone dancing a waltz, waltzing with her on the day of her wedding, you are moved, and you're moved not 
because you see the criminal, but you see a father and his daughter. This is the trick, this is the danger, and this is the beauty of this film. Uh, you see a father before seeing a criminal. Thank you. That's actually extremely helpful and also very touching. Um, the, may I ask you something that is a little bit more uh, generic in a sense and coming out and touches upon more uh, uh, wider cultural issues. And that is, uh, if you could talk about the law, what we could define, what at least I define, the love-hate relationship from World War II on to our days, between American and Italian culture in regards to local and global issues and how American and Italian cinema differed or not in the representation of some of these epochal social and political issues that have created either affinities or discrepancies between the two artistic cultures. Okay, let's start from a general point of view and then we focus on cinema. Yeah. As you know, I live in New York since 1994. And one thing which makes almost 30 years. Uh, one of the things that I keep hearing and hearing is New York is not America. New York is different from America. At the beginning, I was sort of agreed. Which is, it is true that it's different from most of the rest of the America. But then I understood that when this judge, this, this judgment, this comment is made is because whoever says so does not like America, tries to say basically New York is a culture place, is different from the rest of the country, which is a place made full of cowboys basically or wars. And and the fact that New York is so cool and so different is because it's closer to Europe. This is what is the, under, the undertext. I totally disagree. I agree with the fact that New York is different, but what I see is not a difference or an exception from America, but I see what America should be and would later be in the future. It's already America realized, is the realization of the American dream, meaning the melting pot, where through contrast, clash, sometimes violence, horror, and blood, something beautiful comes out. Think of West Side Story, either the old version or the new version. It's a story about, it's Romeo and Juliet, it's a story about gangs of different ethnicity who hate each other, but then something beautiful might come out from the tragedy. So this is from the general point of view. Yes, there is a conflictual relationship. And it's important to see that in terms of movie making, it's very different what happens uh, in the more intellectual world, more refined world, from the more popular broad uh, world of cinema. Think of the Oscars. Some of the Oscars that were given to Italian filmmakers are not only wonderful films, but totally uh, are considered great also from filmmakers. Think of La Dolce Vita, just to give you one name. Other films are definitely good, but closer to the American taste. It, they represent exactly what a large American audience wants to see in Italy. Think of Cinema Paradiso, for example, which is a beautiful film, but is easier than a film like another Oscar winner, Great Beauty, or La Dolce Vita again, or Knights of Cabiria. So you have two different elements. What works here in terms of filmmaking is often, not always, but often, a representation of what the large American audience wants from Italy. They don't care when we're talking about large numbers, about reality. They care more about what they want from Italy, which is a vague 
retro, uh, old-fashioned, melancholic image of Italy, very touristic. I'm not saying that it's not well done. That's why some of the films deal, some of these successful films are often a young kid as a protagonist, such as Cinema Paradiso. They're in the past and they romanticize about something, in this particular case, cinema. So if you offer a film with, that shows crime, violence, desolation, desperation, you can conquer a niche, as it happened in the 60s and 70s with the great Antonioni film, or even 50s, or recently with the Matteo Gagones film. But you will never get the large uh, the large audience they are not interested in italian anxiety depression sometimes reality and again some of these things that are loved only by a niche are quite wonderful such as gomorra by matteo gagone just to tell you one name i don't know if i answer your questions yes 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 if i didn't no. I... but please go ahead do you want to no no no, 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 no. let's continue it's Yes, no, no, absolutely. Um, and as we are talking about this, and you mentioned Matteo Garrone, of course, contemporary uh, filmmakers, as well as Sorrentino and, and others that you mentioned, Tornatore, I'm talking about the directors, the movies you mentioned for his, uh, of course. Um, could you actually, a question that comes to mind, if you could please elaborate on this and talk about uh, current or recent recent uh, and current commercial and or artistic exchanges and of course sometimes we make a difference between commercial and artistic movies that may not be there or it's a very it's a very thin line obviously but you know i'm using i'm saying this to say that you may want if you want to open this up um and uh, between uh, so artistic exchanges i mean called intertestual exchanges or really how do you see the dialogue that there is between current uh, or recent Italian filmmakers and the North American and North American filmography in general? Let me start by saying that I agree with you. It's completely wrong to make a difference between art and quality, sorry, quality and profit, success and art. Sometimes it happens, other times it doesn't happen at all. Let's go to a clear example. La Dolce Vita. It's a great film and a huge success. It's as of today, the highest gross ever from a foreign language film, comparing the, 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 come si dice, la valuta, the value of, uh, of, the, of the dollars in the 60s to today. Uh, it would be like $100 million gross, which is huge for a foreign language film. And it's a great film. But let's go now to your question. If you consider the great costume designer, musicians, editors, art directors, the relationship between Italian cinema and Hollywood or international cinema is still huge. Let me give you a few names. Dante Ferretti, which is why Francesca Lo Schiavo won three Oscar each working always, always. They started with Fellini and Pasolini, but now they won their Oscars with Scorsese and Tim Burton. Three Oscars each. Gabriella Pescucci, extraordinary costume designer, won one Oscar with Once Upon, sorry, she made Once Upon a Time in America, but she won the Oscar again with Scorsese in The Age of Innocence. Uh, Pietro Scalia, great editor, two Oscars. Gabriella Cristiani, great editor, won Oscar with Bernardo Bertolucci, actually, in The Last Emperor. And I could go on. And of course, musicians. Think of the genius of Ennio Morricone. One Oscar for the Tarantino film, uh, The Hateful Eight, and one Oscar, uh, honorary Oscars. So in other words, Hollywood like to hire Italian talents and to get the best from them. When we talk about acting and directing, the situation becomes more complicated. Yes, we have actors who won the Oscars. Roberto Benigni for Life is Beautiful, Sofia Loren, two Oscars, one for La Ciociara, 
the two women is called in America and one honorary Oscar. And, and I think that's it among Italian actors, yes. We had nominated actors such as Marcello Mastroianni who was nominated twice and a few others. In terms of filmmakers, we have the example of Paolo Sorrentino. After the huge success of uh, The Great Beauty and more recently Hand of God, which was nominated but he didn't win the Oscars, he made two seasons of a successful series, The Young Pope and The New Pope, with uh, uh, Netflix, if I remember well, with Netflix. They work, these filmmakers work with Netflix, HBO. But to be honest, this is an exception. It's not what happens all the time. We have excellent filmmakers, not only Sorrentino, Garrone, Alicia Rovac, Emanuele Crialese, Gianfranco Rossi, and a few others. But they are loaded and praised at the festivals, such as Cannes or Venice or Berlin, but they're not definitely popular or successful in terms of money, not in terms of quality. The only one who crossed the path is Paolo Sorrentino. So there is definitely an interest uh, among the American filmmakers for Italian talents, but so far they are more interested in the, what they call the capi sezione, so the, the head of the costume, the head of the art direction, the head of the music, et cetera, et cetera. One of the reasons is because our filmmakers tend to be authors. So they try to make their films, uh, which is totally legitimate, but in Hollywood, this is very tricky. <laughs> When, they, when you hired. That is, that is indeed a very good point. That is a very good point. Um, so, uh, thank you. This, this was very, very helpful. Again, um, very precise, a very precise, very helpful answer. Um, the, what are, in your view, the current, uh, the importance, the effects that the current ideological issues and you can choose what these ideological issues are nowadays on the making or unmaking of Italian and or American cinema. Uh, that is, uh, what do you see are the cultural issues that may make uh, a public choose or not choose a film and um, create or not create a successful film regardless of the of the intentions of the production, of the quality even of the production. And if these current ideological issues um, have an effect in the filmmakers' choices. Uh, you mean what the, what the audience embrace or what? Both, what is the reception? So the audience from a reception point of view, but also from a production point of view. Okay. Uh, let's go back to the end of the previous questions. If you talk about numbers, even the successful films of these filmmakers, the Paolo Sorrentino, uh, Hand of God or Before Great Beauty, I forgot to mention Luca Guadagnino, which was very successful with uh, Call Me By Your Name, which was also nominated for a few Oscars and won the best screenplay and the award went to James Ivory. But however, if you check the numbers, uh, the gross is quite limited. They're not making big numbers. They're respected, praised, successful with awards, but not with money. Uh, again, some of them more, some other, some less. Uh, in terms of, you mentioned the ideology. One of the interesting things in contemporary Italian cinema is that it's post-ideological. In the 70s and 80s, and I know it because I was among them, uh, Italian films were extremely insular. They like to talk to themselves. They like to talk to a very small number of people. And, some, and this transformed most of the film, films in provincial work. Completely uninteresting for international audience. Not only that, but there is another element which is interesting, I think. In the 70s, Italian television, Rai, start producing movies. This was extremely important in order to make great filmmakers such as Hermano Olmi, 
Paolo Vittorio Taviani, even Federico Fellini to make films which would have been impossible without Rai because their films were not successful at the box office. But through Rai, to the idea of a great producer, Rai producer called Paolo Di Valmarana, films such as L'Albero degli Zoccoli, The Tree with the Wooden Cloaks, Padre Padrone by Paolo Vittorio Taviani, La Nave Va by Federico Fellini, but even Por Prova d'Orchestra, Orchestra Rierzo, La Nave Va is The Ship Sails On, were possible. And this it's definitely something we should praise. However, there was a different element and counter effect, which was the moment you have Rai who financed the film, 70, 80% of the budget is covered by Rai. And most of the time, the rest by public money, the, the old Articolo Ventotto, the public funded uh, film law, you when you're lucky, you have a producer who uses the money and doesn't have any energy or interest in promoting the film after it's done because he has already made his money. Uh, and this is when you're lucky. Uh, when you're not lucky, the producers makes the film with only with the money from Rai, doesn't put his, his part of the money, basically steals the money. And uh, so the film is made with the 70% of the budget, which is declared. And this happens, of course. And this makes the films poor, poorer. But there is also a third element, which is also very tricky, which is now it's changed because of HBO, because of Netflix, because of Amazon. But think about the 70s and 80s. When you have a film for television, made for television, which means that soon should be shown on television, you cannot have a lot of violence. You cannot have a lot of nudity. You cannot have, also in terms of language, you should have more close-ups because it's television. Again, this has changed because now on Netflix, you see violence, you say nudity, et cetera, et cetera. This changed the language of Italian cinema. And uh, to make an example, to, I'll give you an example to make clear what I say. Taxi Driver and, uh, and uh, Clockwork Orange, two extraordinary films, would have not be possible in the 70s in Italy because Italian television would never accept a script like that or a violence like that. This is what happened. So the combination between ideology, which was dominant in the 70s and 80s, also early 90s, the combination of the change of language and the, the fact that producers were becoming less and less energetic and interested, basically uh, destroyed the potential and the energy of Italian cinema until the until 10, 15 years ago, with a new generation of filmmakers, we already mentioned their names. Sorrentino, uh, Gagone, Alicia Rockbacher, extraordinary filmmaker, took over. Thank you. Um, could you, in a sense, we touch peripherically about this, we didn't really confront this, but you are, of course, uh, as I said, uh, the artistic director of the Film Festival of Rome, and you have been very much at the center of these events. Could I ask you, what is the weight? You talk about commercial movies, movies that have been successful, that we weren't expect them to be so successful, and movies that actually have been critically acclaimed recently, and but not so successful at the box office with relative success. What is it that, and uh, what is the weight? Let me put it in this way. You mentioned movies that were nominated for the Oscar. What is the weight of film festivals and awards? And of course, you can distinguish the two things because I know they are different and they have different weights depending on the awards on critical and or commercial success. I mean, on critical success, also commercial success, also this is the question. Yeah? What is the weight? What is the weight of film festival and awards? Of course, we have to make. 
it's very different. The only award that makes a strong difference is the Oscars, the Academy Award. It's the only one. If you win an Oscar, your gross, your income, you know, is multiplied. Uh, it's impossible to say how much, but it happens uh, generally. Uh, it happened with Great Beauty. It happened with uh, Life is Beautiful. It happened with many, many Italian films. Then you have the festivals. Okay, sorry. Let's start. Let's stay with the, with the awards. Uh, Oscars. If the Oscars counts 100, I would say Golden Globes count, count 30, much, much less. And even less the SAG and all the other awards. In terms of festivals, if you win Cannes and Venice, which are the two most important festivals, definitely the victory has an impact. But it's much, 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 much less than in terms of money, not in terms of quality, uh, winning an Oscar. It has probably more prestige or equal prestige, but not the same kind of impact in terms of money. For several reasons, uh, American culture is still quite insular, although the intellectual world respect what happens in Cannes or in Venice, the large audience ignore it completely. Uh, not to mention Berlin or other Toronto or other important festivals. So it's more a matter of prestige than, than, uh, than profit. The only one is the Oscars. Thank you. That's what I imagine that it's very clear actually. And um, you mentioned movies made uh, for HBO, for Netflix. And so I do have a question. And uh, this is really a question that uh, you, you made films for television. I mean, docu film for television and you made a feature film for the movie theater. So you have been there yourself as a filmmaker and uh, you, have been, you have been there throughout all these years as an organizer and as a scholar and of course, as a critic of films. What is the role in your mind of uh, television in transmitting, especially with the new media, such as Netflix, Amazon, and so on and so forth through the media? Uh, what is your role? What is the role of television in uh, transmitting more or less the American model to Italian filmmakers, okay. even at the television, even at the TV production level? Okay, yes, absolutely. Uh, let's start from the past once again. Uh, as you probably know, in the Marshall Plan, it was stated that American fil films should have been dubbed. Why so? Because when you dub a film, your audience increases enormously. Now it's changing a little. But until 10, 15 years ago, the profit of an, a film which is dubbed compared to the one with subtitles is huge. Vice versa. And, and this, is, this explains why Italian dubbers are among the best in the world. Vice versa, with a couple of exceptions, couple, all the Italian films that arrived in this country were uh, subtitle, our subtitle. The only one that I remember had also an American dubbed version, Our Life is Beautiful, which was with us two versions, the subtitled and dubbed, and a film by uh, Lina Vermuller, Sweat Away, Travolti da un insolito destino. This means that, again, the arrival of this film in this country was absolutely marginal in terms of money. Now let's talk about television. Your question about, is about television. Television, especially after the pandemic, is a universal phenomenon. Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Apple TV, and others reach everybody at the same time in the new generation 
for most of the new generation speak English, which means that not only they can appreciate films or TV series in the original language, but they create their own palimpsest. This is sort of killing theaters. In Italy, 30% of the theaters, mostly because of the pandemic, are closed for good forever. But the audience has not disappeared. They watch films or TV series on television or on streaming. Netflix, et cetera. And what happens uh, through this streaming, the to these films that are streamed is that you immediately deal with something that, for example, there is this enormously uh, successful series from South Korea. A, an Italian young man from Matera or from Monza can enjoy a series from Korea or an American series or a Japanese series, the same moment is streamed everywhere in the world. This is changing everything in terms of language, language in terms of reception, in terms of distribution. It's changing completely the nature of the business. Thank you. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's very helpful. That's what I imagine you say in a sense. And so I have a last question, and it's a little bit more technical. Do you think directors who used to used to shoot for the large screen, um, do they have to adjust, or do they adjust, or they don't have any issues? And if, if you know about this, if you talk to them, I mean, I've read a few interviews, of course, for instance, Martin Scorsese about it, talk about it, when they actually shoot directly for the small screen, being an HBO series or being a web TV like Netflix or Amazon, for instance, thinking about many movies that have been made directly now for the world. First of all, they, first of all, they already do. For example, Scorsese, uh, director for the small screen for television, at least two things that I remember now. The first episode of Boardwalk Empire, and then he executive producer the entire series. And also the first episode of Vinyl, which was less, less successful. Uh, but let me give you another example. David Fincher. David Fincher produced and directed House of Games, several episodes. So they already work for the small screen, if we can still call it for small screen, because as you know, uh, a lot of people now project in their own apartments. I don't, but most of my friends do, and at least it's larger. Than, than, a TV set, than a TV set, because what cinema is? That's the big question. Cinema comes, as you certainly know, from kinema, which is Greek, which means movement, is the language of movie images, moving images, images that move. But there are a few requisites. The first one is that you should see it in a dark room where the only light is the screen itself, the light should be larger than you and you share this emotion with unknown people with the audience so large screen illuminated unknown people and you're in the darkness if one of these three elements lacks you don't have cinema you have a similar experience similar i'm not saying a bad experience but it's not cinema in order to have that you have to be in a, in a movie theater Thank you. And uh, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful for your time. Thank you for this wonderful interview. I really appreciated everything you said and to offer your wisdom to us about cinema and all the things you know about it. And uh, hopefully we will uh, do this again, maybe in person in New York I love, I love uh, as soon as as soon as we can. So thank you again uh, very, very yeah. much. Sorry.